Hi, everybody. Welcome to the third in our series of Jewish Text and Philanthropy. We are excited today to have uh, our presenter, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, talking about living your Jewish legacy. If you have called in on the phone, I recommend logging in also to the website so you can see the resources, the sources. And if you are joining us, if you could put your phone on star six to mute, and star seven to unmute, you can put your questions in the chat window. And let me give you a quick introduction to someone who probably doesn't need an introduction, but Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs was a chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth from 1991 to 2013. Along with all his speaking and writing, he holds academic positions at New York University, Yeshiva University, and King's College London. We are very excited to have him joining us today. We thank him and all of the staff for helping put this together, and we hope all of you enjoy this. Again, please mute your line. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat window. And Rabbi, we'll let you take it away. Hello. Can you hear me? We hear you great. Great. Okay. So, um, legacy. And I wonder if I could begin with, you know, one of the strangest books in the whole of the Hebrew Bible in Tanakh. In fact, I think it's probably the strangest book ever to be included in a canon of religious texts, by which I mean the book called Kohelet, which is known in English as Ecclesiastes. It's kind of written as an autobiography, very late in life, by King Solomon. Whether it was Solomon himself who wrote it, or it was written by somebody who was trying to think his way into the mind of King Solomon, doesn't really matter. But it's an extraordinary book. It's a very modern sort of book. Because Solomon, Kohelet, the man in the book, tells us right away that he was the man who had everything. He really did. He had um, palaces and gardens and and, and uh, libraries and silver and gold and thousands of servants. He had everything. He had wisdom. He had pursued pleasure. He tried every single thing that life could offer. And in the end, he says in probably the most, one of the most famous lines in the Bible, actually, Havel Havalim, Hakol Havel Havalim Amakehalet, Hakol Havel, five times he says, everything is Havel, which in the famous King James translation gets translated, vanity of vanities, said the preacher or the king, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, if you have a look at this book, and the various translations, uh, King James was uh, 404 years ago in 1611. If you look at the various translations in the 400 years since, you will see the word Havel is translated as meaningless, futile, pointless, absurd, all sorts of things. He's a man who finds life absurd. But actually, all of these are mistranslations. And Havel, this key word that he uses five times in that one sentence, 37 times, in the book as a whole, actually means breath. All the Hebrew words for soul, nefesh, ruach, neshama, are all words to do with breathing, inhaling, exhaling, breathing deeply. And Hevel is a shallow breath. And this is what bugs Kohelet, King Solomon, in all his wisdom. All that separates us from non-existence is Hevel, mere breath. We are mortal. One day we're going to die. And this threatens to rob life of all meaning. Because all that we are, all that we accumulate, all we achieve, only matters to us if we are here to experience it. And all that we are, that separates us from, from inanimate matter is breath. The whole of life is a shallow breath. It's like King Lear in that 
incredibly moving scene at the end of his play that bears his name Shakespeare's perhaps greatest tragedy when he's holding in his arms his dead daughter Cordelia the one who really loved him but he never understood it until it was too late and Leo says why should a, a dog a horse a rat, a rat have breath and thou no breath at all the question Solomon is asking is we will never know what happens after us therefore we will never know what happens to our legacy we may accumulate great wealth but we don't know what our heirs are going to do with it when we're no longer there we may achieve great political power but what happens when we're no longer there and somebody else is in charge we can never really know because however long we live our life is a mere microsecond in terms of the history of the universe 13.7 billion years old what do we add up to what will be our legacy and for Kehelet the answer is we can never know and therefore life is just breath it's nothing and I think it was many years ago it was actually ooh, over 40 years ago that I discovered quite by accident what Kehelet got wrong it was all these years ago and I was seeing a great rabbi he, he, you may have heard of him he was called uh, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schnirsen the Lubavitcher Rebbe I was a 20 year old student at the time and I was waiting to meet him he gave me an audience it was a very lovely moving encounter but I was, as I was sitting in the corridor of his uh, office in 770 Eastern Parkway I was talking to some of his disciples and they told me that uh, somebody had written to the rabbi that uh, in a state of great depression and the letter went something like I need the rabbi's help I find myself very depressed I can't get out of bed in the morning I find no meaning in life I pray but nothing happens I keep Judaism but I I'm not moved by it and the rabbi wrote back a brilliant reply and he didn't use a single word all he did was to place a circle around the first word in every sentence of the letter and the first word was I the rabbi understood that if you really seek meaning in life you will find it not in the eye, not in the prison of the self, but in turning outward and in helping others. That is how you change the world. That is how you leave a legacy. And the one thing missing from the whole of Kohelet is a concern with the other person. There is no book in the Hebrew Bible that uses the word I, or the first person singular, so often. This is what it says in Hebrew. Asitili, kanitili, banitili, asaftili. I built for myself. I acquired for myself. I made this for myself. Kohelet is obsessed with himself. And that is why he finds life empty and without meaning. Because to find meaning, we have to think beyond the self. So I don't know if you've got the first source, which actually isn't from a Jewish text at all. It's actually from a movie that I saw some years ago. I don't know if you saw it. It's a uh, movie called About Schmidt. It is uh, it is a um, film starring Jack Nicholson in the role that he plays best. You know, a rather nasty, unattractive kind of human being. He does it beautifully. He is the vice president of a small insurance company and he's just reaching his retirement and he's thinking to himself, he's the lifeblood of the firm. They'll never be able to replace me. And of course, we, the film begins at his retirement party and his surprise and chagrin. Actually, they're quite happy to say goodbye to him and they replace him rather easily. And he's left with a very empty life in retirement. Um, he, uh, you know, he spends time with his wife but then his wife dies and his life is completely empty and um, 
you know, he all he's got really in life is his daughter with whom he has a rather troubled relationship. And she's just got engaged to a young man whom he thinks is not good enough for her. So he decides to set off in this mobile home across America to try and talk his daughter out of marrying this man. Meanwhile, just before he sets out on his journey, he's idly watching the television and doing a bit of channel hopping. And he catches sight of an advertisement for a charity. And um, it's a charity to, you know, help starving children in Africa. And, uh, you know, just idly, out of sheer boredom, he sends a little donation, whatever it is, $10, I can't remember. And uh, the ad says this child will reply to you. And um, so um, he gets a letter back saying uh, there's a young man, a young boy called Ngudu, who has received the money and is very grateful. And maybe you'd like to write to him. So from time to time through the film, Jack Nicholson is composing in his head letters to Ngudu in Africa. And... um, they allow him, as it were, to be the voiceover, to run a commentary on his life. Well, he eventually gets to see his daughter. His daughter really rejects and rebuffs all his efforts, she's saying she's trying to rob her of the one piece of happiness she will ever have. And he's, as he's driving back from this failed mission, he is thinking to himself, what is my life really worth? And he says, composing what is going to be his last letter to Ngudu. One of the most poignant speeches I think I've ever seen in cinema. You've got it in front of you. He is writing to Ngudu as follows. I know we're all pretty small in the big scheme of things. What in the world is better because of me? I'm weak and I'm a failure. There's just no getting around it. Soon I will die. Maybe in 20 years, maybe tomorrow. It doesn't matter. When everyone who knew me dies too, it will be as though I never even existed. What difference has my life made to anyone? None that I can think of. None at all. And then he reaches home. And he opens the door. He's been away for several months driving across America. And there's a great pile of junk mail. And he's riffling through it as he sees One letter that stands out, it's got a child's handwriting. And he opens it. And there's a little letter from the person running the charity in Africa saying, Nguru can't write yet. But he wanted to say thank you for your donation. And he sent you this little picture. And there's a child's drawing of two stick men, one big, one small. Obviously, the big one is meant to be Jack Nicholson and the small one is Ngudu, and they're holding hands, and the sun is shining, and they're both smiling. And the film ends with Jack Nicholson looking at this child's drawing, and tears are running down his eyes. He suddenly realizes he has done one good thing in his life. He's helped save a child from starving. He's helped make a young child in Africa smile. And he suddenly realizes just how wrongly he lived his life and how that one act has somehow redeemed it. And it's one of the most moving moments in cinema. And this is what Kehelet missed. And I'm just going to, while we're still on this page, if you can see the top source, source one, I'm just going to leave this as a question. We'll get to it in the end. But if you've noticed in our Siddur, in our daily prayers, every single day, just before the beginning of the verses of praise, early on in the service, we say Psalm 30, Mizmur Sheikh Hanukkah Sabais Le David, a psalm, a song for the dedication of the temple by David. And I just want to plant this question in your mind. You and I know that King David didn't build the temple. He wanted to build the temple, but God said, no, the time isn't right. Maybe you're not the right person to do it. You had to fight battles. You shed blood. The temple should be built by a man of peace. Your son will build the temple, not you. So why do we begin our davening every morning by saying, 
a song of the dedication of the temple by David, since David didn't dedicate the temple and he didn't build it. I just leave that question in your mind. Let's move to the next source. And here it is. A very, very powerful statement in the Babylonian Talmud, in that big tractate called Baba Batra. And it's in the form of a little, almost a child's riddle. And here it goes. There are ten strong things in the world. Rock is strong, but iron breaks it. Iron is strong, but fire melts it. Fire is strong, but water extinguishes it. Water is strong, but the clouds carry it. The clouds are strong, but the wind drives them. The wind is strong, but man withstands it. Man is strong, but fear weakens him. Fear is strong, but wine removes it. Wine is strong, but sleep overcomes it. Sleep is strong, but death stands over it. We're left like Kohelet was, in a world in which we're going to die, what is worthwhile? Death seems to be stronger than anything else. But the Talmud goes on and says, no, there is something stronger than death. Tzedakah, acts of charity, for it's written, Tzedakah delivers from death. What an insight. The sages are telling us that that is what lives on after we are no longer here. Acts of kindness that we do make a difference to other people's lives. And those people make a difference to other people's lives. It's to name another film called Pay It Forward. People pay it forward. We do good to them. They do good to others. And somehow, one act of charity can send ripples through many, many lives. And as we saw, as I said with Jack Nicholson, just one act of making someone's life better can overcome our fear of death. Let me tell you a little story. I was officiating at a wedding just yesterday. It was really nice. It was out in the English countryside. The sun was shining. Young couple, both of whom are going to be doctors. Nothing special about them. They were both lovely Jewish young men and women. They were young bride and bridegroom, really nice. I mention it because they discovered, sharing their family histories, a document written in 1912, 103 years ago. The bridegroom's great-grandfather had been the signatory for the bride's great-grandmother testifying to her, to the British government, that she could come as an immigrant to Britain, and he would vouch for her. They weren't related in any way, but he did this act of kindness for a stranger. And I said to the young couple, well, there it is. You see, God never forgets an act of kindness, and he repaid it 103 years later by letting their great-grandson meet the other woman's great-granddaughter, and they met, and they fell in love, and they married. Now, obviously, God doesn't reveal his script quite so clearly quite that often but no good deed that we ever do is ever forgotten or is ever wasted on the air it is the good deeds that we do that live on after us and give us our share of immortality which takes us to the next source very interesting source about a king one of that country called Adiabene in the first century CE who converted to Judaism, there were in the, around what is called the intertestamental age, the end of the Bible and the birth of Christianity. Around that time, there were a lot of people in the Roman Empire who converted or half converted to Judaism, including King Monobaz, who was king of Adiabene. And during years in which there was tremendous drought and people were suffering terrible poverty, The Talmud says he spent all his own treasures and the treasures of his fathers on charity. And his brothers and the other members of the family reproached him, your father stored away treasures, adding to the treasures of their father, and you squander them? He replied, my father stored away for the world below, while I am storing away for the world above. My father stored away in a place where the hand of others can prevail, where other people can take this wealth. But I have stored away all this wealth in the 
place where the hand of others can't prevail. My father stored away something that produces no fruit, while I have stored away something that does produce fruit. My father stored away treasures of money, while I have stored away treasures of souls. I think that's a very beautiful, a beautiful thing. What is our legacy? And Monobazzi's family, quite conventionally, said a legacy is something you have in the bank, something you have in the vault, something of value that you're going to pass on to future generations. And Monobaz says, that is not a living legacy. My legacy really is living. I help people at a time of great, great poverty and, and scarcity. And I have stored up treasures that will live and produce yet other treasures in turn. I think that's a lovely story. Let me, if I may, before we go on to the next source, give you another story which kind of says the same thing in slightly different words. We had in the 19th century in high Victorian England a very great Anglo-Jew. His name was Sir Moses Montefiore. Sir Moses Montefiore was well known in the Jewish community. In fact, he was the lay head of the Jewish community, president of the Board of Deputies. He was sheriff of the city of London, a good friend of Queen Victoria, and a very religious Jew, a Jew who traveled the world helping Jewish communities in difficulty. You can see the carriage in which he traveled if you go just by his windmill in Jerusalem, just outside the old city, Mishkanot Shananim. It's a part of Jerusalem called Yamin Moshe, named not after Moshe Rabbeinu, not over to Moses, but named after Moses Montefiore because he built those, the first Jewish houses outside the walls of the old city in the 19th century. Somebody once turned to Moses Montefiore, who was a very wealthy man, and said, so Moses, what are you worth? And Moses Montefiore replied, thought for a while, and he, then this is the 1850s when money was worth a lot more than it is today, and he said, oh, I don't know. 100, 200,000 pounds. And his interlocutor said, Sir Moses, I know you must be worth millions. And Sir Moses turned to him and said, well, actually, I own millions, but you didn't ask me how much I own. You asked me how much I'm worth. And therefore, I worked out how much I have given to charity so far this year because, and these were his words, we are worth what we are willing to share with others. And that was Sir Moses' legacy. And that, of course, is why we still remember him while all the other great eminent Victorian Jews are pretty much forgotten. Uh, except for the Israeli, who, as, as you know, was converted out of Judaism. Anyway, that is that. We are going to move on to the next source, which is a really interesting one. Here we are in one of the famous scenes of the Bible. It's the story of Joseph and his brothers. His brothers, as you know, resented Joseph because he was their father's favorite, and Jacob made no uh, pretense of the fact that he loved Joseph in particular very specially and gave him that coat of many colors, that richly embroidered robe, and his brothers got very jealous. And In fact, their acrimony there, Resentment of him grows, grew so intense that they actually plotted to kill him. They saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other, Kill, come now, let's kill him and throw him in one of these pits and say that an animal devoured him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. And then something is written in the Hebrew. I don't know if you can see it. It's got the little chof aleph by it in the Hebrew. And Reuven heard, he heard what they were planning to do. And he saved him from them. Now, that is a very, very unusual phrase. It's one of the only phrases I can think of in the whole Bible that's clearly not true. He didn't save Joseph. In fact, um, he merely uh, 
put forward some delaying tactics. He said, let's throw him in the pit. Let him, let's leave him to die. Alone. Let's not actually kill him. His intention was to come and rescue him a little later on. But by then, the brothers had already sold him as a slave. So it wasn't that Reuven actually saved him. And you can see the English has not translated it literally. It says when Reuven heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. So what the Hebrew is doing is crediting him with the intention as if he had done the deed. But he didn't do the deed. He wanted to rescue Joseph. He planned to rescue him later on. But he didn't do so there and then. And let's move on to the next text, because we are going to see that the rabbis said on this something very striking. If Reuven had only known that the Holy One, blessed be he, would write of him, and Reuven heard and saved him from their hands, he would have picked him up on his shoulders and carried him back to his father. If only Reuven had known. Now, what is this text and the rabbinical commentary telling us. I want you to imagine for one moment what would have happened if Reuven had actually done the deed there and then, if he had rescued Joseph and taken him back to his father. Joseph would never have been sold as a slave. Joseph would never have been carried off to Egypt. Joseph would never then landed up in Potiphar's household. He would never then have been accused by Potiphar's wife of attempted rape. He would never have been thrown into an Egyptian prison. He would never have interpreted the dreams of the butler and baker. He would never then have been taken out of prison to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. He would never then have become second viceroy of Egypt. And he would never then have been in a position to take all his family and settle them in Egypt, the result of which is our ancestors would never have gone to Egypt. They would never have become slaves. We would never have to clear all our house of all the Chomets on Pesach and all the hard work. The whole course of Jewish history would have been different. And Reuven would have known that were he able to read the book. But the trouble is we can never read the book because we are one of its characters. We very rarely understand what hinges on a decision of ours to do a good deed or not to do a good deed. We never know. Had Reuven known the consequences of his delay, he would not have delayed. He would have rescued Joseph then and there, and the whole of Jewish history would have been different. But we never know. And what the sages are telling us is this, and it's a remarkable statement. You actually find it codified by Maimonides. Our next act could change the world. We're never sure. And therefore what the rabbis are saying is, Whenever you have a chance to do a good deed for others, as Reuven had the chance to rescue his brother Joseph, just do it. You never know which act may change the world. So the sages took exactly the opposite view of Kohelet with which I began. Kohelet felt nothing was worthwhile because we never see the consequences of our actions. And the sages drew exactly the opposite conclusion. Everything is worthwhile if it helps another human being because you never know which act is going to change someone's life. And the rabbi said famously, Nefesh achat ke'olam malay. One life is like a universe. So if you change one life, you begin to change the universe in the only way we can, one life at a time one day at a time, one act at a time. So there it is. Our next act really could make all the difference to someone's life, just as Jack Nicholson's $10 made a difference to Ngudu. Right, we're still moving on. Oh, my goodness me. Now, here's a bit of Hebrew without any translation. Is that right? Okay, here it is. 
I am um, no no that's no no it's just Hebrew okay so there you got a lot of Hebrew and I'm going to read it for you it's from Sikhtarabati and it says as follows Oma David David said Agura ba'ohalacha olamim I will live forever within your tent he says to God now that's what David says I will live forever in your presence now the rabbis were puzzled by this. Did David actually think he was going to live forever? What's this that he said when he said, I'm going to live forever in your tent? He said, He said to God, Please God, may it be your will. Shayamru bishmila olam let it be said forever in my name, in synagogues and in places of study, that that God said to me, by your life, even though you're going to die before you have the chance to build the temple, in shemcha zazmi beitila olam, your name will never be separated from it. You will all, it will always be known as David's temple. And the truth is, says God, every sacrifice that the priests offered in the temple, the Levites sang songs, and they were always psalms of David. So for the whole lifetime of the temple, your songs, David, will be sung. And that is why David said, I will live in your tent forever. Wherever Jews pray, they will say my psalms. And that is how I will live forever. And uh, it carries on. And not only this, since, this is what God said to David, since you had the idea of building the temple, even though it's your son Solomon who actually is going to build it, I will write that house, the temple, in your name. And that is why it says, Mizmo Sheh Chanukat Habayit Le David, a song at the dedication of the house of David. Isn't that beautiful? Even though God said, David, you're not going to live to see the temple built, it will always be known as your temple. And we still, every single day, read that Psalm, Psalm 30, in which we call the temple by the name of David. And now I want you to, to see in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 the story of what actually David did. He knew he wasn't going to be able to build the temple. But what he did was he gathered all the money for the temple, for all the uh, building works and all the vessels and so on and so forth. And just before he died, he gathered the nation's leaders around them, and he made this speech. Then King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. The task is great, because this palatial structure isn't for man, but for God. And with all my resources, I've provided for the temple of my God gold, for the gold work, silver, for the silver, etc., etc. You can read the rest of that source in due course. We're going to move on to the next page. Where is it? And then you can see in verse 6, they all gathered together, and they all gave, and so on and so forth. And then in verse 10, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, O Lord God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom you are exalted over, as head over all. And that is the speech that David gave the leaders of Israel before he died, the speech he wanted to make on the inauguration of the temple, but he knew he would never live to see that day. It wasn't 
in his fate to do so. And so he made that speech. Why do I say this? Because if you turn to the next source, you will see that we recite those lines every single morning at the end of what's called the Psuke de Zimra, the verses of praise. And uh, we recite that speech. David, bless God in the eyes of all the congregation and said, blessed you, O Lord God of Israel, etc., etc. David's speech before he died is the speech we say in our morning service every single day. Now let's just move on to the next source. Can you see? Um, and it says in source 9, again, I'm sorry, I've only got the Hebrew. Uh, this is a source in the Mechilta, 3rd century work, very ancient work, same time as the Mishnah. And it tells us that there are 10 great songs in Jewish history. Hashminit, the 8th song, was the song that King Solomon said. When he recited this song that I mentioned, we began with Psalm 30. Mizmor Sheir Hanukkah Bait Le Davida, Psalm, a song at the inauguration of the House of David. And the rabbi said, V'chi David b'na'o? Did David build the temple? Halo Shlomo b'na'o? Um, uh, as it's, uh, it, it, King Solomon built it. As it says, V'ayvin Shlomo et abayit. Solomon built the house. Why then does it say a song at the dedication of the house of David? Because David gave his all to build it. He had the idea. He gathered the money. He instructed the people. Because he gave his all so that that house should be built. It's called his temple, not Solomon's temple. David's temple. Whatever we set ourselves to do, even the things we can't do ourselves, but we inspire other people to do, and we resource them to do, and we give them some of the resources that enable them to do it. Even though they are the ones who do it, it is called by our name. It is our little piece of immortality. And if you look at the very last source, you will see a little law which you may have noticed that at the end of the Pesukah of Zimra, the verses of praise, on a weekday morning, we stand at that point and somebody brings the charity box around the shul and you give a little donation to charity. That was a custom instituted by the Ari, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, who lived in Sfat in the 16th century. And why did he do it? Because he wanted every one of us, every day, to share in that act of King David, of giving some money to charity so that somebody else could build something in our name. And that is why we begin our davening, the Pesuke de Zimra, with that psalm, a song of David's house. Well, let me sum up what we've learned, I hope. Number one, we began with Kohelet, the man who had everything but found meaning in nothing. Why? Because he kept thinking of himself. And thinking of yourself will never give you meaning in life and will never give you a legacy. And then we went on by a rather violent contrast from the heights of spirituality to Jack Nicholson in a rather good film, I have to say. And that ending, that heart-stopping ending where he suddenly realizes that his one little act of charity done almost without thinking about it was the one redeeming feature of his entire life. And we saw that that film was telling us in secular terms what the sages were telling us, that there is only one thing stronger than death, and that is charity. Then we told ourselves about King Monobaz, who explained to his family that by giving money to the poor, he'd created a living legacy, not one that lives in vaults, in banks, or museums. And then we turned to Reuven, and we suddenly realized that we can never know which of our acts will change the world. And therefore, the rabbis drew from the conclusion the fact that we will not see the things that live on after us. It's not a reason not to act. On the contrary, it's a reason to act. 
and every good deed is remembered. And then we saw how David, because he wanted to build the temple and made it possible, had the privilege of being remembered for that every single day for 3,000 years from that day to this. And even though the temple hasn't been there for 2,000 years, we still speak of him and we still credit the temple to him. And then we ended off with that lovely Jewish mystic, Rav Yitzchak Luria and Safat, telling us that we should all do likewise, even if it's only a small coin to charity. We help build the future, and that is our legacy. That is our one claim to immortality in a way that we can understand. So I hope some of these sources have spoken to you. I know every one of you listening live these values, and I hope it's just been a little reinforcement for you to understand how the values for which you live are the values of our sacred and great tradition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rabbi Sachs. That was a very thought-provoking, insightful uh, piece and a perfect preparation for Shavuot and a continuation from the JFN conference to Shavuot. If anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, you could post it in the chat window. We'll give it a minute. Ooh. I'm sure there's going to okay. be lots of thinking, and the questions will come after. Are we are we able to see those? You'll be able to see them if they post them. Let's see. Are they coming up now? So far, no one's asked any questions yet. Maybe someone's typing. Let's see if there are any questions. Here, someone is Ooh. asking a question. So, Michael, right. if you could post it in the chat window, please. Just raise their hand. We'll give them a second to type. Sorry, having trouble actually posting into the chat window, so I wonder if we could just ask our question. Sure. You can. <laughs> so what do you say to somebody who doesn't believe in um, that it's their responsibility to build for the future. They give now, um, but they don't believe that that building for the future in general is their responsibility. You, uh, what I've tried to explain is, you know, deep down, um, we believe the soul is immortal, that there is life after death, there's Tchiyatametim, there's the world to come, and so on. But somehow or other, that feeling that Kohelet had so powerfully, you know, the world will go on, but we will not be there. Um, that desire for something of us to live on, I think, is probably the deepest human desire there is. Um, there was a, um, you know, um, I don't know if you remember the writer called Ernest Becker. Does does that name resonate with you? Hello. She, she you know this desire again. for something of us to live on, which led Shakespeare to write his plays, Beethoven to compose his music. Everyone who ever did anything great has that desire to live on. And um, just as we invest in a business, so we invest in a people. We invest in values. Um, if we ran an economy just on what we could consume today, there would be no investment and there would be no economy. So we cannot live for the present alone, and that applies, I think, pretty much to every, um, every human life. Um, and that really is the difference between happiness and pleasure. Pleasure lasts for the moment. Happiness endures. And I think there are very, very few people who are immune to that kind of feeling and that kind of thinking. Thank you. Are there any anybody else would like to ask a question? Here we have one. It's, it seems from the quote from King David that that there's a place for us to demand to have the causes and charities that we support be named after us. How does this reconcile with the notion of giving charity and secrecy? 
<laughs> Maimonides said the greatest form of charity is one where, uh, well, I mean the second greatest, the greatest form of charity is to uh, allow somebody to dispense with charity by giving them a job or helping them to start a business. But the second level of charity is where the recipient doesn't know who is the giver, and the giver doesn't know who is the recipient. So Maimonides holds that anonymity in charitable giving is an immensely high virtue. However, the uh, 14th century Spanish writer Rosh Barra by Shlomo Ibn Adret said that there is a very good reason to name things after their primary donors, and as the French say, pour encourager les autres. When people see that somebody's name is attached to it, and because of that, they have something that lives on after them, they too are moved to give. And that's why in Judaism we allow people to have their names be known. Not everyone does, and there are some great, great buildings that I know of, very famous ones in Israel, in which there are no name plates. We know who gave the money, and that particular family never wanted their name mentioned on any building they paid for. But, um, as I say, it was the Rashba who came along and said, yes, it is a reasonable demand that somebody can make to name something after them, and um, not only is it reasonable for them, but it is also has the effect of encouraging other people to give. And if I can just say this about a couple who um, I knew, they were friends of ours, and very sadly now, neither is uh, alive anymore, and that is the late Morris and Vivian Wall, W-O-H-L, that name may be familiar because very many buildings and the garden around the Knesset and the big auditorium in bar and many, many things are named after the Morris and Vivian, who were beloved friends of Elena and myself, were not blessed to have children. And Morris always wanted their name to be on those buildings because he said, those are my children. They're, the, they're as much as God has given me. Um, so um, I felt very moved actually whenever I see a building named after them that uh, the, those are the children of a very fine couple who are not privileged to have living children Thank you we have time for a few more questions if anyone wants to ask we'll give people a chance to type or you can click on the raise your hand. I might be able to unmute your line. So Rabbi Sachs, do you have any last words if no one's going to ask questions? Or last shavuot offer? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just at the end of the day, you know, here it is. There's one of us, there's seven billion people on the face of this planet. And it is so easy to ask yourself, what difference can I make? You know, I'm a wave in the ocean, I'm a grain of sand on the seashore, I'm dust on the surface of infinity. And Judaism insists, no, we can make a difference, and that difference will live on. And I just think that is really what makes Judaism so very special. I don't know of any other civilization, let alone religion, that took so high a view of human possibility. And um, that is why, although we remain less than one-fifth of one percent of the population of the world, we have had an impact on the world out vastly out of proportion to our numbers. Because we believe we can change the world, Jews have more out of all proportion actually done things to change the world. And that's what I encourage each of us to do. So uh, thanks for um, your, your listening. Thanks for your participation. But thanks above all for all the good you do, which begets so much more good. May God bless all you do. And in that lovely word, lovely prayer that Moses, according to tradition, gave to the people who built the first 
temporary temple, the Mishkan. May God's presence, may his Shekhinah live in the work of your hands. Have a wonderful Shavuot, and may you continue to be a blessing to the Jewish people and to the world. Thank you very much, Rabbi Sachs, and thank you, everyone. We will have this recording available. If people would like to review it and listen to it again up on our site in a few days. And again, thank you, Rabbi Sachs, and to everyone who works with you for helping uh, coordinate this and put this together and for you sharing your words and wisdom with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Be well. Bye.